everyone, welcome back. We are watching We Stand Alone Together, the Band of Brothers documentary. I'm really thankful that you guys suggested this to me because I, re I wanted to know more about the real men of Easy Company. And I saw, obviously, in Band of Brothers, just this little, the quick little snippets of the real documentary. And so I had to watch this, so I'm really thankful to do that. Um, I'm excited. I'm really excited to hear their stories. I want to hear their voice, but I'm ready to get into this. If you want to watch the full version of this reaction, you can join my Patreon on YouTube. This will be the cut down version. Um, and those links are in my description box below. And you can just find me on Patreon at Iman Snow. Okay, well, let's see how this goes. I was standing on the top of this uh, hill at the aid station and a random shell came in and when I tried to get up I only thing I could see were the broken ends of my legs and I thought my legs were gone mm. or both femurs were shattered mm. and they were laying down here as I was in my back trying to raise my legs up and then the next thing I thought of was my mother thought what what she what she gonna say because I was an only child oh man wow so this I mean that's so crazy that all that that was real that shot it's so crazy that this is that this actually happened I can't believe they have footage that's amazing Carwood Lipton. That's I was me. born in Huntington, West Virginia. Grew up in Huntington. Frederick T. Heiliger, Concord, Massachusetts, was my hometown. I was born in uh, Washington. Uh, it's on an Indian reservation up in northeastern Washington. My name's J.B. Stokes. I was born close to Bonham, Texas, in a rural area called Leonard. My nickname was Babe. <laughs> and my mother, <laughs> she was a little Irish, really red hair. <laughs> Fiery, great woman, great woman. Aww. Born and raised in South Philadelphia, where the Garnier. times were tough. Garnier. Mom Garnier. had ten children, so you had to yeah, work to survive. <laughs> that's what it was. It's just survival in the streets of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. so. I got a paper route, you know, that <laughs> five bucks a month I made, something like that, you know. But it was at least something. There's a work ethic that the great Pennsylvania Dutch in this particular area. I think that's winters. The USA is in a war with Japan, and everything just went silent. Mm. Something was wrong with you if you weren't in the service in those days. It was just what you had to do. In interesting. Nobody forced you to do this. You volunteered. Yeah, winters. And it was the notion. It's crazy that they volunteered. They volunteered. You want to be with the best. Wow. But once you got in there, you was proud to be. Shifty. You know those people better than you will ever know anybody in your life. I, I believe mean, you that. know them right down to the final thing, you know. And that that comes when you start your training while that, that progresses. We were just a bunch of ordinary kids when we went in, most of us. And a lot of the training was to build you up physically. And mentally. I weighed about 130. Oh, it's perfect. If I'd have lost 40 pounds, I wouldn't <laughs> have been big enough to stay. <laughs> oh. Had to climb this mountain called Curahee every, every morning, run it up and back. If you couldn't do it, why well, you'd end up in another unit. Mm. Of course, the name Curahee, as I understand it, means we stand alone together. That's a, an Indian name. You would still go out on your own and run the mountain at night. Really? which was ridiculous because when you had to run it during the day, all you did was bitch and moan. <laughs> and at night, you'd get a couple of guys mm. and go up and do it on your own. No experience in the Army at all, uh, coming in directly that's, that's from civilian life. That's interesting to know. There was a bunch of guys out there that already made their jump, and they was all hollering, you're going to be sorry, <laughs> you know. Well, foolishly, I didn't think it'd be so tough, but... Uh, the first time, the first jump you make is not uh, not all that bad. 
you don't know what you're doing. It just seemed like when you step out the door, it was a thrill. It was a high, as they say. These days. <laughs> Everybody just seemed to enjoy it, so they went out. The landing was the hardest part. Uh, the men were trained, hardened, physically and mentally, and they were ready to jump. As you pull out of the harbor and you pass the Statue of Liberty, will I ever be coming back? I don't know. Right. But that'll make anybody stand and search his soul for a few minutes. Especially you. <laughs> I feel like he's just such an introspective human being. No liberties, no nothing. You couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. Can't. They had guards around the marshalling area, yeah. so nobody could leave. That's when you felt that this right, is it. Right, right. It's we sunk not in know which reality. Day. We did not know where we were going to jump. That must be a different feeling. Oh, man. Your experience of jumping out. That's, I'm very curious about this one. I just, I'm so thankful they have, like, actual footage of all of this. Absolutely horrendous. It was like a July the 4th celebration, 10 times over. Then it had gone brrr, like gravel hitting on the fender of a car. That's why everybody wanted to get out of the plane as fast as they could. Whether it was high, low, no matter where we were at, out. They wanted out of the plane. They were getting shot up. And I jumped up on the oh, run and fun. hit the static line with the hook and out the door, you know, and the. And the got such an opening blast from the, the opening it broke this chin strap that we had on this helmet liner and, and uh, that's when I lost this famous leg bag that everybody talks about just from the shock of the opening they got to be this big and you keep stuffing everything you can get your hands on that he is like he's the way, got 10, everything pounds. on by the time you get done My 40 goodness. or 50 or 60 pounds everyone that jumped with a leg bag or supplies okay. they lost it of Most course, that that makes sense. That's crazy. One of them. Oh yeah, that's it right. tore right off because we jumped at speeds of 150 oh, my miles goodness. an hour, maybe even higher. I don't know. Only I was gone out and oh, my leg no. was in, and I was hanging what? upside down, looking at everything down with my leg in the plane. And Paul rolled me out. Paul Rogers rolled rolled me out. I just helped him out. I just. Picked him up and threw him out, I guess. Uh, had to get out. We we just wanted to get out so bad. And I could see the tracers, and they were uh, kind of spraying crazy. around it, uh, concentrating on me. Damn. Apparently, it was not a very oh, good, good shot. Well, yeah, clearly. But they were firing in clearly, every direction. That's terrifying. Even. And we were running into the Germans everywhere, but we had to hide. Mm -hmm. You know, because if, if we didn't, we were dead meat. Quite a confused situation, but we were uh, better prepared for it than the Germans were. The Germans didn't know where we were. And on, that, on those mm. boats, those Germans had those big guns aimed right at them, you know, and just waiting on right. them. Oh, they had it tough. Right, they had it tough. Right. I am one of them. Damn. Lieutenant Winters had us set up a firing position and uh, went up to scout it for myself. I could see a trench. And I thought I knew where our machine gun was. I look up and I peek through the bushes and I see a couple of Germans over here about, oh, you know, 30, 50 yards away. And on and I threw it as high and as far as I could throw it in their general direction. The damn thing had enough hang time on it that about the time it got to them, it went off in the air and, and I got one wow. of them. Come over there and, and, it, and I said, well, he's going to miss me. And that thing fell right down in that trench with me. He out of the way of it and went I off. Didn't. And I felt like it blowed my butt over my <laughs> head. And it pretty near did. <laughs> oh, my God. Does he holler help? No. He hollers, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Lieutenant. I'm sorry. I goof. Oh. It's Aww. beautiful. When you think of a guy... Who was that dedicated to his company, to his buddies, mm -hmm. that he apologizes for getting hit? 
But that's the kind of guy he was. And that's the kind each one of them was. They were all the same. Jeez. Each man with great respect. Respect I can't describe. Each one of them proved himself that he mm -hmm. could do the job. If I had done a little bit better job, there would have been a couple more men oh, going home. I can't control that, though. As a parachute, we got that done in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, 1944. That's cool. Me and Johnny Martin. That's cool. Trunk is a strong. <laughs> so, yep. But we thought we thought, well, hell, the war is just starting. In Christ, we're 50 percent. Not gone now. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. There were young kids that came in, and for some reason, I don't know why, they were the first ones killed. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but uh, I got right there to where I didn't want to be friendly with replacements coming in because, God, I didn't like seeing them get killed. I just, it just tore me up. To, Noon time, 70 degrees. Perfect the drop day. was perfect. It was a mass drop. Everybody was dropping on the same. It was maybe 150 yards away that it blew up in our faces. These rocks and timbers were flying all around you, and you can't help but think to yourself, oh my God, what a way to die in combat to be killed with a flying timber. Mm -hmm. Then the, the Dutch. They, it was just marvelous, their, their reaction. They, uh, they loved Americans and still do. They call us angels from the sky, which we were. I mean, you, you're on the German occupation for four yeah. years, right? Mm -hmm. Horrible. And you see paratroopers come out of the sky on Sunday morning. <laughs> Who are they? They were mm -hmm. angels. That makes sense. They loved it. Restrained there. How happy they that were to see you. Sense. And it was hard to even get down the streets because the people were out there swarming all over us trying to congratulate us. We didn't mind, you know, nicely. We were young. <laughs> we didn't mind at all. And they were really proud to see us. And I threw my arm up like that and went down. It but within three feet of me or four. But when it went through my arm and hit me in the head and I was I was bleeding pretty pretty And he threw it at me. I ducked down it hit my helmet and bounced off. So when that thing bounced off my helmet, I hollered out to the guys below, live mm. grenade. And I had enough sense to know that that's that grenade that hit my rifle and is laying right in front of me, oh in my, my face, gosh. practically. Because I just got turned just part way, and it exploded, and then it, it caught me in the face, neck, left arm, under the arm, in the shoulder blade. Wow. I remember that. Like it was just, I run up and I grabbed him. And he said, oh, don't touch me. I said, Joe, what's the matter? He said, I'm hit all over. He said, I, I'm bad. I said, okay. As bad as he was hurt, Joe Toy, he said, Heffern, I already checked him. He's gone. Jim Campbell might be alive today. If he hadn't have said to me, Efren, you stay here with your gun. I'm going up. Mm. And I never, 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 I sleep on it, I eat on it, I never, never forgot mm. that. So bad all your life. You gotta remember what one guy did because he thought it was his job to do, and he took a shot for you. The physical exhaustion affects their endurance to be able to cope. You don't realize it at the time you come off the line from living in the mud and being absolutely miserable for 70 days straight, days that you're gonna be facing Bastogne. Oh my God. It is, oh, it is it is it is this is Bold Jack yeah. Wood, right? Yeah. It is the woods. Sure looks different now, there ain't no <laughs> snow.
These trees might have been replanted. Look how I straight think if the trees look like they did in 44 mm. or 46. Yeah. Amazing for them to just go back there and the see where they were. The town of Fort is right over there after the empty field where those cattle are That's grazing. Like half a mile away. Yeah, yeah, we had an outpost set up. Well, Sir Cloud said plenty of artillery. Most intense yeah. everyone trip right here. Shelling. Right. Most intense mm. in the world. You couldn't believe it. You had to be here. They made mush meat out of them. Georgie Lutz come no, over and he hollered, I can't see nothing of them. There, there's nothing there. They were all gone, just disintegrated. Wow. Unmerciful shelling. Pause it sometime, like for this moment at, at least. It's just what a feeling, I think, to have. Like that they, they survived this. They lived through it. They battled there. They saw their friends die there. Uh, and for them to come back so far into the future where there's, it's, you know, it's free. There's not a battle. They're much older. You know, they've dealt with other parts of life, family, friends, you know, going back to civilian life and all of that and then coming back here. And I mean, how awesome for them to even do that, like to... Because I, I could imagine that could bring up a lot of pain, but also closure, maybe closure. Maybe there is something. It's just, uh, it, again, it's just another brave thing that they did. It's, it's just really amazing. It was the most miserable place I've ever been in my life. Even today. A real cold night, we go to bed and I... I, my wife will tell you that the first thing I'll say is I'm glad I'm not in Baston. He turned up, and every one of them was telling us, you know, that they're going to kill everybody. They're running over everybody. To set up defensive lines and to stop mm -hmm. the Germans. They, they said they couldn't be stopped. Asking the guys that's retreating, you got any extra ammunition or a hand grenade you don't want? You get, oh, yeah, you could hear the firing going on up ahead, and we're marching towards it with hardly any ammunition. In wartime, the Mother Earth is your best friend. And uh, you can always dig a hole and get out of sight, you know. You'd be surprised how quick you can get through that hard ground when somebody's shooting at you and them shells are falling. Now, you can make fast work of it. They became experts on foreign European soil. We dug in, and two people could dig a better hole than one. In the ground that's frozen, it takes quite a while. But we went through a couple of shellings. Uh, and fast on that were uh, earth shaking. If you lived through them, you remember them for the rest of your life. And I'm not sure you're the same for the rest of your life after you lived through them. You never forget. I don't think you can forget. And the Germans had this, you know, this woods of ours zeroed in completely. And and as we hit the woods, why this tremendous artillery attack came. I thought the whole I thought the whole world was shooting at us at once. Wow. I jumped into a, a foxhole that somebody had started, and then all of me, so from about my nose up was, was above the ground, I could see all these shells hitting. Joe got caught not near his hole, and uh, Bill and I were ahead of him, and, and Bill had not been hit. Joe said, Jesus Christ, what, what do I have to do to <laughs> die? He actually said that. He got hit real bad. So that was real. Can see what I could do for him. Bongo, I got it too. He was sitting on the ground. His leg was badly mangled. He was holding his leg and it was jerking like that. Jeez, I can't forget that. He had been hit before, but uh, they really got mm. him there. They brought a, a jeep down and we put him on stretchers and, and, uh, I better not talk about him. I better not talk about him. It was terrible. Here had lost their legs there. Uh, a number of other people were killed. It was uh, a difficult situation. When a man was wounded, we felt glad for them. We felt happy for them. He had a ticket to get out of there mm -hmm. and maybe a ticket to go home. And when we had a man who was killed, we found that he was at peace. We're glad that he found peace. Yeah. And 
to this day, he says, I haven't got one scratch. He says, I'm afraid when I do get it, I'm really going to get it. He was right. In this little town of Foley, he, he got killed. But I never did wonder. Never give it much thought. You, got, you just live from day, uh, day to day. Keep your fingers crossed. And that was it. I have the honor to present the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower. I need to be here today to take part in a ceremony that is unique in American history. Never before has a full division been cited by the War Department in the name of the President for gallantry in action. With that tradition, therefore, will always be associated the name of the 101st Airborne Division and of Bastogne. Good luck and God be with each of you. There was almost a solid line of German troops coming north. And uh, our job is to get to the end and get to the heart of it. It's the re retreat that Hitler had for himself. So crazy. And he built his uh, eagle's nest. Even when I watched this in the series, I was like, this, is, they, this isn't real. So it's relax real. and confer wow. this is real. with his staff because they all followed him to Birch's Garden. This was their final retreat. This is crazy. And of course, this is where they had their, their loot as well. It's a place to capture. This is the one everybody wanted. Hitler's Birch's Garden retreat, burned by SS troops in the war's last days. The chalet from which he hoped to rule the world now lies That's in ruins. Right. No fighting, no shooting. The only thing I seen in Birch's Garden was a couple dead black uniform SS troopers laying on the road as we were going up. Took over his house and uh, liberated it, you might say. Money that they were living. I was a pack rat anyway. I picked up a lot of German items, including some uh, postcards and envelopes wow. addressed to Hitler. The place was full of this big arch, you know. Rembrandt and all those people, you know, and hanging on the wall, you know, of course, the old soldiers like us, we don't recognize <laughs> the painting when we see it. German Goering's personal um, art collection, hidden in a subterranean so chamber. 1,200 artworks worth untold millions are included. Go back to rightful owners in pillaged nations. That is crazy. They just took everything in there. That, we I mean, found Hitler a, in them. a vodka and stuff like that. What much whiskey. Those people don't like whiskey. And we took it all and set up a bar. The yeah. Eagle's Nest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we stayed pretty well oiled. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well oiled. <laughs> I started well, drinking it one day and I drank. I didn't wake up the next day. <laughs> I made a two day of <laughs> thing out of it. And it tasted, didn't taste like it would hurt you. It tastes like ginger ale. <laughs> that the whole company fell out in their underwear. <laughs> we didn't even have to dress, you know. Uh, but everybody was pretty well loose, and uh, so uh, we just fell out in line formation That's in the underwear. That's hilarious. The peace with the world, that a big, happy, satisfied grin on their face. Mm -hmm. It was a paradise for a soldier to move into. And I had seen the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I had seen what big Germans had done mm -hmm to the Jewish race, and I'd seen what they had done to uh, the displaced persons. They had done to their occupation in Holland, Belgium, yeah. for their homes for a few nights to uh, bed down my men. And uh, if they picked up a few trinkets, I had no problem. Nobody has ever taking their time to tell you how to handle surrender. We'll talk about that when we get there. Well, here we are, we got it. Now, how do you handle this? He's the sweetest man in the world, I swear. They didn't, they didn't drag down, you know, or nothing like that. Uh, they came down as, uh, as, as uh, defeated so I think we thought that the Germans were probably the evilest people in the world. But as the war went along, we found out also that it wasn't the Germans per se, it was the SS mm -hmm. them that could kill their own people and the regular 
German soldier that guy, was not he that looks way. like he's 13. One of those prisoners in her book for the mass. And all of a sudden, I'm faced with the thing, hey, I haven't got Nazis here. I've got some Catholics. And I've got a Catholic good enough to stick one of these in his pocket. Well, that man and I might have been good friends. We might have, we might have had a lot in common. We might have liked to fish, you know. He might have liked to hunt. Uh, you never mm. know, you know. Of course, they were doing what they were supposed to do. And I was trying to do what I was supposed to do. Under different circumstances, we might have been good friends. I have a great deal of respect for them as soldiers. They are very good soldiers, but they're still enemy. Yeah. So they must be controlled as prisoners. I was assigned this major, and when he walked in, he presented he me this pistol wow. and offered his personal surrender, which naturally I accepted gratefully. And this is basically the end of the war for my men. And the significance is that it wasn't until later when he had given me this pistol and I had a chance to look at it carefully. This pistol had never been fired. Wow. There was no blood on it. So we all wore it in mm -hmm. with an agreement with no blood on yeah. it. And I assure you, this pistol has never, never been fired since I've had it. And it will not be fired. Wow. And then what then, you know? Like, what now for them? We didn't come home and, and flout ourselves. I didn't come home and, you know, I was a war hero. I just come home and went back to look like what we did before. Mm -hmm. I think it was difficult for most fellows coming back. They didn't know what they were going to do when they got out. I didn't. had no idea. Did some bartending and ran a pool hall. And took a course in ornamental horticulture. Didn't pay very much, but a lot of nice people. That's cool. I became an industrial arts teacher and a social studies oh, that's teacher. Cool. Spring of '46, I took a boat to uh, Ketchikan, Alaska. I went to work for the government, a letter carrier for 37. One of the construction. So I went cute. into hard work, tedious <laughs> work. I'd done everything. You name it, I'd done it. I worked it on the waterfront. And I went with the CIA in Washington. Got my degree in 1948. Working for Nixon nitration oh work. God, he was I was so making seventy-five dollars a week. God, he was amazing and really handsome at the same time. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> I done well too. Yeah. Thank God. I want to welcome each and every one of you oh, with this tonight is... to celebrate the that ending so awesome. of a fine reunion. Thank you all for coming. And I want to extend the best wishes to all the men from Company E506. Oh. I love you. God bless you all. Thank you. It's just to give us a chance to get together and talk to each other. We relive some of the... Some of but we have together elements. So cool. Great respect and you might say affection for each other. The type of affection that you get when you've lived through many dangerous mm -hmm. situations together and have mm -hmm. learned that you can rely on each other. Today, a bond so sure. a bond you can't explain. <laughs> Soon you see it, you know you're thinking of battles and thinking of it Aww. to yourself. There's an intimacy develops, and uh, like nothing that I've ever experienced anywhere, not in college, not, not in any, with any other group of people. We're a strange <laughs> bunch of uh, dudes, as far as I'm concerned, to be this close after all these That's years. Amazing. That's that's the thing that gets me. I'm back in my youth now. Mm -hmm. When I get to these guys, I'm back when I went to service. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'd like to make 20 more reunions. We had a lot of real good times in there. And those are the times that you really remember, you know. That's, a lot of those is, is what we kid each other about, you know, at these reunions. Mm -hmm. My family didn't know anything about it. And I would just didn't tell them. I just, you know, figured it's something that uh, didn't need talking about. It was done, over with. So, but we, he started talking about it just in the last five, six oh, years, wow. last five, I'd say. It was like he, that was another life, you know, was, he was another person, and uh, we weren't aware that it dawned on me that he killed people. I, I really, I really admire my dad, my daddy. <laughs> He's a, he's a good guy. He's a real strong guy. We've been to, to France and to that cemetery.
okay. It's just incredible. There's crosses upon crosses upon wow. crosses and just r lined up perfectly as far as the eye can see. And then there's the cliff, you know, and then the ocean. These weren't just anonymous statistics. These were people that I knew. And these were, and yeah, I told my daughter, wow. I said, this guy here died at age 19 or 20. A whole life never lived. Family, nothing. No children, no, no opportunity to have some satisfaction right. of building a life, nothing. He looks at me and he said, yeah, I was very lucky and he started crying. <laughs> These guys have been with each other in the absolute base experiences of human existence. They were there with each other. I, you're thinking you're gonna die or seeing people dying all around you. Yeah. And there they went, day after day. And uh, yeah. That's what's incredible. I admire that. I held my father even on his tombstone as Sergeant Joe Toy. <laughs> 506 PIR, 101st Airborne Division. That's what he wanted on his tombstone. How it happened that uh, those various individuals happened to end up in E Company, I right. don't know. <laughs> but as you know, every Army unit thinks it's the best. <laughs> uh, but we knew we were the best. Mm -hmm. Think about most of them every day. Something is. It's in your memory, I guess. Am I a little proud of having once served in that outfit? You bet your life. I wore that eagle on my right shoulder for 18 years. Probably the proudest thing in my whole life, having been in Easy Company 506. Yeah, it's amazing. The heroes had crosses over their heads, the ones that are buried mm -hmm. in the cemeteries. Those are the true heroes, not mm -hmm. us. We're just part of the work, that's all. And we thank God we got back alive. How would you like to be a mother or a father whose son never come back? Yeah. The son and the mother and father are the heroes of the Second World War. It is. I don't believe there's very, very, very few heroes that came back from the war. <laughs> the letter that Mike Ranning wrote me, do you remember how he ended it? I cherish the memories of a question my grandson asked me the other day. Grandpa, were you a hero in the war? Grandpa said no. But I served in a company of heroes. That was beautiful. I'm very grateful to have watched that. I, I'm so grateful that I watched Band of Brothers because I'm, like I, I, I've been saying in, in the last um, reactions as well, this series has opened my eyes to see the perspective of, of other people who I'm, whom I may not have ever even looked through. Just showing me how important these men were, everything that they, di that they did, it, it's mind-boggling to hear these men talk, and and you could just hear in their voices. They're these men. They're genuine. They cared. They still care. They did what they. Most of them volunteered to put their lives on the line. They didn't know if they would come back. A lot of them didn't. They did it for because it was the right thing to do. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on nowadays? Of course, there's always going to be good people, but it's just, we're, 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 you know, if, I mean, as someone who is on social media, this is my job. I just see a very huge, a big difference. There is a difference between what, what men are maybe looking up to now, like the people who are popular and, and I'm not going to name any names, but the people who are popular on certain like podcasts. And they're like, this is how you become a man. This is how you are. And it's like, S but then I watch this and I hear real men speaking, talking about this is what we had to do. And we, and we did our job and we cared for each other 
and we carry the weight of what we did and it, it's within us and we're not heroes and the people who passed on and who died over there they're the real heroes even though these men did unspeakable uncredible things like something that will most of us will never experience or do but they're like no we're they're humble it's it's like worlds apart from kind of the men of today not all men i'm not going to say all i'm just going to say that we all as people humans we all need to step our games up big time because this and i'm speaking to myself I am speaking to women, I am speaking to men, I am speaking to everybody. I think that's like the real message that I get, like number one, these men are heroes. Of course, they're not gonna say that they are, but they are. They, they did what so many people probably would never want to do or could do. And they were, they were humble about it the whole time. Just beautiful, beautiful, and I can only say thank you, truly thank you. This. They didn't have to get the scars on them, the physical and the mental. You can't get rid of scars. You can't get rid of them. It's there. It's there. It's there. there. They, 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 some of the men spoke about that. They'll have these memories etched into their minds forever. And sometimes it's the once they wake up until they go to sleep, the same things replaying over and over but they still have smiles on their faces. They still went back to doing work when they came back home. They still, they didn't complain. They just did it. They just, because this is the human experience. They really knew that. And I think we're forgetting that. I know I sure did. I was, you know, you think you deserve things, but you, we don't really deserve, we deserve certain like, I think people deserve to have food and a home and you know a shelter and, things like that because you really can't it's hard to get back on, up off of your feet if you don't have that but other than that like this is we're all equal here and we all should work hard and and do what we need to do and be grateful i'm left feeling really grateful it just gives me some hope i think like i know that this isn't lost this type of this is inside all of us this type of hero heroism it's there but it's it's most of us aren't ever going to see it because we live pretty easy lives not everyone but a lot of people do nowadays especially in western uh in the western world so you don't ever have to f see what you will who you are because you're never put into a situation of like oh shoot like this is fight or flight now we got to figure out what what you know this is a hardship a lot of people don't go through too many hardships in, in, in this day and age. So I think in some, you know, toughness does come from challenges. Toughness comes from adversity and you see who you are. And, and a lot of times you get broken down, but then you're able to, to be like, as time goes on, you say, you know what, I'm either going to stay down or I'm going to get back up. And that's when you see it, but you won't see it unless you get any type of adversity so I think we're all afraid I know I was of, of, of ever having like these bad things happen but that is a part of life and the bad things that happen happen to everybody and it, there is no prejudice in that it will hit you the rain falls on the good and the bad the fact that they said that in the beginning they had no prior training they just volunteered they were like this is what's happening we need to do the right thing let's go they had good people to train them, obviously. Like you had, you have to have great training to be who they became. But the fact that they kept saying, "I don't know how we got so lucky to have all these great men in our company," and and like that, most people in in the war would say, "Hey, like our company or our group is the best." And I think it shows more so than not that at the end of the day, there are more. There is more good than bad. And I think even, even if things are at this point in our time shifting towards like maybe like, you know, there's like this little thing in the middle here. And of course, if you go down too far, then you, you're, you know, you, it's the, the dark side. And then you go over here, it's lighter on this side. I think even if you're here, 
on the dark side, you could still shift back. And so eventually maybe things will, maybe things are heavy on here. So we're kind of tipping this way a little bit, but it eventually adversity happens and people start to, the good will come back out where people are like, you know what? We need to do stuff. We need to work together. We need to help each other because I do believe I have optimism and hope that that is in our nature too, that there is good and that people will always find that good. Yeah, I just, I, I think this was, this was beautiful. I'm just so thankful. Um, I don't want to, I really don't want to let these men go. I said that in the last, in the, in, in, at the end of Band of Brothers, and I'm saying it again. I'm just so thankful that we, we got to see their account on everything, that they had these reunions, that they really, you know, they just, they kept themselves together and like were able to find their their friends every you know every couple of years in these reunions and take care and laugh and have fun and joke and just be just be good just have a good time because they obviously they they do deserve that and and it is it's interesting that a lot of people who are veterans who've been through wars it's hard for them to talk about it i i i've heard this um, many times now and it is just interesting that usually it's like later later and later in life that they'll want to start to talk about it and um i think it 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 it, it i think it's important to talk about it so you can give your experience to to your kids and your family and they could pass down that story and the story the oral traditions are really important so that people can remember the the past remember your history so you don't you know you know you do not repeat it and then i think a lot of the time it's too hard to maybe re re you know to bring it back up i understand that i also do believe that you don't want to lose any of that because what they went through is really important and you don't want that to repeat. It's beautiful what humanity can do in the in the face of the bad that humanity can do. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for watching and I will see you all very soon. Take care.